Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much uh, for joining us to this second panel uh, that is going to be dealing with policy coherence for migration health, the challenges and opportunities. And it is for me a pleasure to, to be here uh, again with this uh, group of good experts that uh, we have managed to, to come to bring together uh, to this panel. Uh, migration is certainly uh, a global phenomenon, a global social phenomenon, and can be recognized as social determinant of health. The migration process exposes many migrants to health risks, such as perilous journeys, psychosocial, psychosocial stressors, abuses, exposure to diseases, harsh working and living conditions, interrupted care, and limited access to essential health care services. Barriers to exceeding health services include irregular migratory status, language barriers, a lack of migrant inclusive health policies and administrative hurdles. Such disparities impact the well-being of migrants and host communities as well, and undermine the realization of global health as well as social and economical development goals. Migration health raises questions of, right, of rights, of social protection, public health, international relations, foreign policy, security, and development. The health sector alone is unable uh, to offer all of the solutions. Health can no longer be absent from global migration agendas if we are serious about leaving no one behind. The UN and member states are looking at the adoption of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration in two weeks. The forthcoming WHO Global Action Plan to promote health of refugees and migrants due for, 20, for 19, 2019, May 2019, and the UN High Level Meeting on Universal Health Coverage in September 2019. So there are a large number of important events coming. This IOM Council is therefore, in our opinion, a very opportune moment to discuss the opportunities and challenges in global and national migration and health processes to promote a multilateral, uh, multi-sector action that enables migrants to be integrated into communities. We have a very rich and diverse group of panelists here today who will discuss how their work has contributed to the promotion of migrant-sensitive healthcare policies and plans for affordable and non-discriminatory access of migrants to health services. This session will focus on the strengthening of synergies in policy commitments across migration, health, and development sectors. I am confident that the panel discussion will conclude with commitment at the highest level from stakeholders gathered here today to ensure complementarity and integration across sectors governments and UN agencies to support the migration health agenda. Let me start. Uh, I will do a brief introduction of the panelists uh, at the moment that they are going to be talking. Uh, so let me start to my right, Dr. Naoko Yamamoto, that is Assistant Director General for the Universal Health, health Co Coverage and Health Systems Cluster of the World Health Organization since 2017. Dr. Yamamoto served in numerous health-related positions within the government of Japan before being appointed director of the health and medical division of the Ministry of Defense, making her the first woman director in the Ministry of Defense of Japan. We are happy about that too. <laughs> uh, so let me start by asking you a question, Dr. Yes. Yamamoto. In 2019, member states and the UN will come together for a high-level meeting with the theme of universal health coverage. 
moving together to build a healthier world. In your opinion, what are the main challenges and opportunities to ensure that this high-level milestone will indeed be inclusive of all, including migrants, and how can the current global migration and uh, migration health policies, out, policy outcomes, feed into the universal health coverage high-level meeting? You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Madam uh, Moderator. Thank you for your kind in, in introduction. Also, I really appreciate to uh, invite me to join IOM meeting. Uh, yes, uh, the next year, uh, we, in September, at the UN Assembly, uh, UHC high-level meeting will be expected, and we also expect the high-level political commitment to achieve UHC in all over the world. So, you, if I talk about inclusiveness, about the including mig migrants, I should say three levels. First is a continuous dialogue about the health and migrant issues, during the, including during the preparation of the UN high-level meeting. But the second is declaration itself, because high, uh, political leaders are going to, hopefully, to have uh, some high political declaration they are going to uh, adopt at the UN. So how we could uh, uh, ex expect and, uh, the member, uh, member states and head of states to talk about health UHC, UHC, including migrants. And more, uh, finally, uh, but most importantly, implementation at the country level. How to translate the uh, uh, declaration to the clear action at the country level, uh, including increase, inclusiveness of the migrants. And if you, uh, Madam Ch uh, Moderator, you asked the challenges and the opportunities. So uh, let's say, I, I say three challenges. First is uh, for migrants, we need a very strong voice about the uh, uh, human rights of the migrants, including health. Um, I know that the migrant issues is very cross-cutting issues, and many uh, different ministry are in charge of it. And that is a, one of the, it's a uh, powerful, but sometimes it dilutes the voices. So this is a, one challenge. Second challenge is we need more good, uh, we need to share more good experience at the country level. How to work for the migrants for, health, for their health together with other people's health. So this is a second challenge. And uh, because the, if we, government need uh, try to achieve UHC or maintain the universal health coverage, government need to plan uh, and also the government set the priority. What kind of services we can provide? To whom? By, ho by how? And who pay for it? That's the detailed discussion we need to do it at the country level and regional level and global level as well. So this is a second challenge. So we need to learn each other more about how to implement it. And the third challenge is uh, lack of data. I, my colleague gave me a raw data about the IOM created about the demographic data and the volume of the impact of the migrants and the refugees issues. But still we need more data and more research about health status and the health needs and also health system for the migrants. So this is a three big challenges, I think. But at the same time, uh, when we talk about opportunities, because when we talk about UHC, I usually talk with the Minister of Health, the Minister of Finance of each country. If we, each country, the head of state, uh, committed strongly, the, something can do it. But when we talk about the, really we really need to uh, make uh, true about no one will, will be behind policy, of course the migrants and marginalized populations to think about it. In that case, dialogue between, dialogue between countries and country or regional level is very important. And the migrants issue will be give us a good opportunity to enhance the dialogue between countries. And so this is a big opportunity, I think. And uh, also uh, another issue is uh, workforce issues. Uh, the uh, workforce is the most important for achieving UHC and the health sector. And the migrants of the workforce, also the big challenge is for us. So uh, I really believe the uh, dialogue between uh, working together with IOM and WHO uh, 
hopefully, to provide a good opportunity and a good achievement of the health for migrants. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for keeping the time totally, <laughs> keeping within the time. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think the uh, Global Compact on Migration give us an opportunity to work together on this. I will uh, move now to my, to my left. Dr. Antonio Mujobo is advisor to the Minister for Health Insurance of the Ministry of Health in Mozambique, uh, a medical doctor and general surgeon. He ha here has also served as a military doctor for a decade. Uh, Dr. Mujobo also teaches medicine and surgery at the Eduardo uh, Mondlane University. So welcome to the panel too. Uh, so, Mozambique is making great efforts to address the issues of migration health in country and in the region across national borders, including, for instance, the tuberculosis burden in the mining sector. Um, so, uh, I will, we would like to, to know your experience on that and how, uh, what, what can you share with us uh, from that experience? Thank you. Thank you. Let, let me first, and on behalf of the Minister of Health of Mozambique, thank the International Organization of, for Migration for the invitation to participate in this important meeting, specifically on this migration health topic. As we know, Mozambique shared his long border with six African countries, Tanzania, Zambia, Malawi, Zimbabwe, and Fatin and is the main corridor for landlocked countries, Malawi, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, to his way to Mozambican ports and to the commercial hub of South Africa. Although recently, inter inter internal migration in Mozambique is increasing due to mineral extractive companies and the promising gas extraction in the center and north of the country, the flow of migrants is still to the hub of mines of South Africa. Disease like tuberculosis, HIV, among others, are quickly spreading along the those referral geographic spaces, burdening the migrants' health, particularly in mine workers, their families, and the communities. One third of tuberculosis is the southern region of South Africa, Lesotho, and Mozambique. Uh, and HIV prevalence is the main source of Mozambican mine working in South Africa, uh, which go to 25% of prevalence. This prevalence is highest in, in our country, in the south of the country. The Minister of Health of Mozambique has national programs which is in charge with these two big programs, HIV and tuberculosis. Uh, so if, we, if, we, if we, we, we choose challenges to be addressed in this issue, I, I only choose four because there are many. One, is advocacy to the mining companies in order to create a better work environment to the workers. Because tuberculosis spread uh, easily in a closed spaces. So ventilation, uh, protection to the workers will be a big contribution. The second challenge is behavior sexual education, mainly to the workers, even the communities around. The third is a health approach coordination among, the, among all stakeholders, stakeholders involved, government, private, and, and United Nations agencies in order to maximize efforts and avoid duplication and minimize verticalization of, of funds. The fourth will be the research, as, as was told here. Research is the key because research uh, will inform the policy making 
in the response to, to response to the to the region. In terms of opportunities, early diagnosis through an periodic screening to workers will help to early diagnosis and treatment to the to the uh, 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 workers. So, medicine also is a challenge. So, if we can provide medicines for people who are being diagnosed, will be good. To start, thank you. Thank you very much. It is indeed uh, one of the important challenges, and I, I know that we have been working uh, together uh, on cross-border health programs uh, with the Ministry of Health, and, and we certainly look forward to continue this uh, collaboration. So let me move to my far right to Mr. Pascal Barolier, uh, who is the managing director Managing Director of Public Engagement and Information Services at Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Before joining Gavi, Mr. Barolier was Vice President of Global External Communications at Sanofi Pasteur, the world's largest vaccine manufacturer. He has also coordinated Sanofi's global con communications during the 2009-2010 influenza pandemic. So, uh, Mr. Barolier, in September 2016, the UN General Assembly adopted the New, the New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants. How has the Gavi Alliance engaged in the agenda since then, and what have been the main drivers for your engagement? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. And I will start with the second part of your question uh, before getting to, to the, the how. I would like to cover the what. Um, so first of all, um, let me in a nutshell uh, say what Gavi is about. Um, Gavi was created in 2000 uh, with the goal of uh, introducing uh, new vaccines uh, to the poorest countries. Since 2000, the mandate has expanded. Uh, and uh, at the end of uh, 2018, at the end of this year, uh, Gavi and Gavi is an alliance, so Gavi and its partners, WHO and uh, UNICEF and, and many others, can claim uh, having vaccinated 700 million children uh, and in the process of doing that, having uh, saved 10 million lives, uh, additional lives um, of people who uh, would not be here today if they had not been vaccinated. Um, so. How relevant uh, is Gavi in the, in the discussion that we are having today? Well, I think the main driver of uh, Gavi's engagement has been reality. Uh, today, when we look at the latest figures from UNHCR, uh, nine uh, out of 10 countries where uh, refugees uh, find asylum uh, are Gavi-supported countries. This is the reality we are talking about. If we go more into the details of, uh, of our drivers, um, our key uh, engagement principle has been to leave no one behind and has been particularly focused on the right to health and particularly for children. Um, so our, our, our key goal has been to reach vulnerable populations. Um, the reality is that today one out of five uh, children still miss out on basic vaccination. Uh, that means 20 million children uh, don't have access to vaccination. They may have access to polio vaccination, but they don't have access to the most basic vaccines. Uh, and these children uh, happen to be uh, predominantly uh, living in uh, fragile countries. Um, out of the 70 countries that Gavi supports for vaccination, uh, 16 countries are uh, deemed uh, fragile. And among those countries, about 50% of the unvaccinated or under-vaccinated children live. And that includes, of course, uh, refugees. Um, so that is really the reality check and the main driver uh, of, uh, of Gavi's engagement uh, into this uh, policy uh, discussion. Uh, moving now to uh, the how of uh, Gavi has been engaging in the, in the discussion. Um, 
the team um, uh, that uh, focuses on, uh, on these this policy changes at Gavi uh, has been taking the view of not only focusing on immunization, but really focusing on health. So as you know, we have worked very collaboratively with our, our, our partners at WHO to, to focus on the, on the health proposition rather than on just the immunization uh, proposition. Because we see uh, immunization as a, as a building block of primary health care, uh, and when you have immunization, you actually have many other things. Uh, actually, immunization is uh, the single most um, um, high on the list intervention uh, in the, for the families during the first year of life of children, because on average, a family uh, sees uh, um, a medical facility, a doctor or a nurse five times during the first year of life. And so when you have the opportunity to see children five times in a year, obviously you want to do more than immunization. And that's where collaboration uh, plays out. So we, we have been building that offer uh, also um, leveraging the, the supply chain, the cold chain that is being put in place to deliver vaccines to also work on other interventions which could benefit from the, the infrastructure that are being put in place for immunization. Uh, this, this obviously has been um, you know, leveraged fully and is continuing to be, to be leveraged. Um, training is also a key, uh, a key uh, investment where we, we jointly uh, work together with UNICEF, WHO and, and, and others. Um, and lastly, uh, the engagement in the GCR and, uh, and GCM discussions uh, have helped us um, get a better view uh, of, of, the, of the status, of the health status of the refugees. Uh, and you mentioned data earlier, I think access to data is also a key, uh, a key aspect. So uh, in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's been the, the drivers of our intervention. Thank you very much. We, we appreciate very much the work that you are doing and the figures that you are presenting is, are, are amazing and, and certainly one of the things that we need to ensure for the future generations that they grow up in a, in a, a protected uh, environment from that perspective. Let me uh, move now to uh, our last speaker, um, Dr. Rapi Pong, Sup Supan Chaimat. I hope that I have not destroyed your name. Uh, he is a researcher and medical officer in the International Health Policy Program at the Bureau of Epidemiology, uh, Department of Disease Controls at the Ministry of Public Health of Thailand, as well as the head of the non-Thai population research unit at the International Health Policy Program of the Ministry of Public Health. Could you please uh, share your, uh, the experiences of how Thailand, as an important destination country in the region, is responding systematically to the health risks, vulnerabilities, and resilience of migrants and mobile populations? And what is the role of health providers and community health strategies? Uh, and maybe also mention which are some of the unresolved challenges that you are facing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and very pressure to present myself here and share experiences from, from Thailand. I think that there are three questions from you, right? And with limited time, so I've tried to address as much as possible. So the first question is how can Thailand cope with the influx of uh, a number of migrants uh, from our neighboring countries and how we incorporate them into our Thai healthcare system. Uh, I would like to reiterate that Thailand has already achieved use of health coverage since 2002. And with this uh, achievement, we, we think that this is not the, the, the ultimate achievement because there are still a number of non tribal populations. So there, therefore, we apply a, a gradual piecemeal approach in order to incorporate these migrants into our uh, uh, healthcare system, and, and, and this is uh, already embedded in the principle of uh, or in the statement of many uh, high-level authorities. Uh, for example, in, in the Ministry of Public Health, uh, the Ministry of Public Health of Thailand already uh, launched a series of border health plans, and the National Health Security Office, which is the res responsible agency for the universal health coverage scheme, the main scheme for the Thai population, also launched a statement 
And in, in that statement, uh, it's clearly, it clearly indicates that uh, the National Health Security Office uh, uh, aims to include uh, all people on the Thai soil, I have to say that, not Thais or, or the non thai or people on the Thai soil, to be uh, covered by the insurance, to the public insurance. So this is the first question, I think, so it's from the from, from, from the principle of the high authority is that I give a very clear mission to incorporate the Thai, uh, to incorporate the non-Thai people into our system. Second question is the role of community health workers. Uh, we long, long before we already implemented what we, the so-called uh, community health workers to, throughout all sub-districts in, in, in Thailand. So they are serving as let's say the healthcare soldiers at the local level in order to uh, facilitate uh, the access to care of the Thai population. So we use that model as well to migrants. Let's say we already implemented the so-called migrant health volunteer, similar to the Thai healthcare uh, community health volunteer. And this program is already uh, 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 supported by a number of international partners. IOM is one of them. Uh, IOM, WHO, uh, and USAIDs, and we also mobilize our domestic resources to, to implement this. And this program, will, uh, we, we will have the number, a number of uh, what the so-called migrant health volunteers, and these volunteers will help uh, minimize the, the gaps between uh, the gaps of cultural or uh, religious differences between the Thai healthcare professionals and the migrant users themselves. So this is the second question I think that I would like to reiterate. And the third question is about the unsolved challenges. I, I think when we, call, when we say challenges, we have to set our mind, set our, um, to, we have to shape our mindset that this is a challenge, not the problem. If we think that it's a problem, we are always facing problems. But if we think this is a challenge, we can, we can reap in benefit from the challenges. I, I list around, around a number of, uh, around a few issues that I think this is like a, a challenging issues. First is the, the open of, or the advent of the so-called, the ASEAN community. Uh, so there will be a, a huge influx of migrants in the future, not only in Thailand, but also in other countries as within the ASEAN as well. So how we cope with this situation, I think this is the first time that we have to, to, to deal with it. Uh, the second is challenge is the policy coherence uh, between Thailand and other countries, and also within the Thai, within Thailand as well. Because uh, when we say social inclusion, social rights, something like that, it's not only the health sector, right? It's about the work, uh, the legitimacy to, to work lawfully or live or reside uh, lawfully in the country. So how can we cope with this? I think that's another challenge. And the, the last challenge that I would like to mention is the international cooperation. Because we cannot deal with this issue alone, right? This is not a matter of Thailand. Let's say if you face an, somebody who is already undocumented, and you, you would like to legalize them, how can you do with that? You have to trace back to their uh, country, to their country of origin, right? So, so that's why you have, we need a seamless um, international cooperation in order to, to deal with uh, the migration issue. Thank you. Thank you very much and for this very clear uh, explanation. And I think that uh, several countries here uh, will feel uh, reflected also the, their challenges and the needs that they have in order to deal with health of migrants uh, like what you have described. So let me turn for a second round of questions uh, back to uh, Dr. Yamamoto. Uh, so against the background of this universal health coverage uh, convention that is going to be adopted, two World Health Assembly resolutions that promote migrant health, and the WHO Global Action Plan to promote the health of refugees and migrants that is under development as far as I understand. The recently uh, released WHO uh, Global Action Plan uh, for Healthy Lives and Wellbeing for All. And the 2018, October 2018 Astana Declaration on Primary Health Care that do not explicitly uh, refer to health of migrants, but uh, nonetheless, <laughs> There is uh, something important there. How can IOM, WHO, and other UN partners work together to avoid 
uh, missed opportunities in the future no? for policy coherence and uh, immigration health. What can we do to bring those things into these discussions at the, at the health policy level? Thank you very much, Madam Ch uh, Moderator. You challenging the question is um, you using missing opportunities. So it's a very, uh, very, how can I say, edgy question. Uh, you mentioned about the Astana Declaration. It is uh, uh, in 40 years ago, Armata, in Armata, in Kazakhstan, public health people agreed Armata Declaration. It's a health for all declaration. And after 40 years uh, later, in the last month, I think, more last month, we uh, did, uh, member states de agreed Astana Declaration. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the Astana Declaration, there are no specific mention about the uh, migrant issues. But the Astana, I don't know necessarily to excuse, but the Astana Declaration is very, member states agreed to be concise and aspirational one. So they didn't, they didn't list about the vulnerable, who is a vulnerable population, who is them. But uh, regarding the, you mentioned about action plan of uh, SDG 3. So SDG 3, of course, is a health issues. And uh, together with Gavi or like a, a t traditional, how can I say, health related UN agency and global initiative work together to make a global action plan. So we didn't uh, have, a opportunity, have an opportunity to work with it, work with it. but uh, of course the health for all, including migrant, migrants. So I don't say that miss the opportunity, miss, we miss the opportunity, but to use the opportunities as much as possible for the future, as you, your mm -hmm. question is, first of all there, as you said at the beginning, we have a lot of international big uh, event or fora coming. So I really would like to encourage member states together with the UN agency and the global initiative and other stakeholders work together to use the opportunity as much as possible to highlight migrants' health. Second is uh, civil society's uh, platform, or multi-stakeholders platform. In the UHC era, in the forum, we have a UHC 2030. It's uh, like a big uh, platform. Many stakeholders get together, to, and uh, of course, um, the, as uh, uh, Dr. Antonio said, that uh, TB and HIV, these people also talk about migrant issues and health and the human rights issues as well. So I really would like to invite the migrants uh, related the civil society organization and other stakeholders who join, work together. Finally, it's, uh, practically, the, for the UN High Level meeting, uh, member states have already agreed to set a multi-stakeholders hearing. It's in New York. So mm -hmm. uh, I really encourage uh, people to could join that, um, to discuss about it. So uh, maybe I have one more minute. So I think, finally, I just share uh, with uh, one episode. The couple of weeks ago, I joined uh, some uh, panel discussion, which is also talk about the health, uh, but not only the health global issues with multidiscipline people. And so I really remember some panelists clearly said as he said, that, quote, in this transformative era, including global politics, climate change, or migrants, so many things happening in the world, but health will be a good platform to invest solid solidarity in global community. I think the solidarity is one of the key words to work together. So I remember the, uh, the statement and uh, uh, keep my in my mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, I think there are opportunities, and I'm hoping that uh, I understand that we are going to sign a memorandum of understanding right. between yes. IOM and WHO soon, yes. uh, next year. So I hope that we work more, even closer together uh, in the future, trying to address those issues and avoid this gaps in policy discussions at the health level about migrants. So thank you very much. We will come back to you probably with questions uh, from, from the audience. Uh, let me move to Dr. Mujovo. Um, what are the programs for social protection in health in Mozambique, uh, given the emphasis on achieving universal health coverage as part of fulfilling the sustainable development goals? How can these programs be inclusive of migrants? And you already described uh, some of the efforts that you're having, and we know how Mozambique also is a, is a country f through which migrants not only go, come, but also they pass through. So how do you include migrants there? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, social protection in Mozambique 
um, is a law mandatory. There is a law who direct, who give direction to do uh, things related to social protection. Uh, social protection must be provided to all population, inclu including in the, in the rural areas. It is done by public facilities, which cover 60% of, of the population, the remaining 40% by community health workers, and with some participation with uh, tra 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 traditional uh, health. Practically, the health, care, the health care in Mozambique is free of charge. There are a, a very minimal contribution from population, but very minimal indeed, that practically is free of charge. 96% uh, of our facilities are primary health care, uh, and now are being re reinforced in human resources and the, at, the, at the question of the infrastructures in order to respond to the challenges of the universal health coverage. Our health system don't discriminate migrants. One of the examples is the settlement of 7,000 migrants in one of our province since 2001. And another 7,000 living freely somewhere in the country. We look for migrants as active person because many of them bring expertise to our country. We have doctors for migrants, nurses, engineers, etc., working freely uh, as uh, what American is doing. Uh, it is true that, uh, another thing, those, those set, set, settled uh, migrants have all healthcare care, healthcare facilities where they're living. So, so no discrimination to them, and uh, we, are, we, are, we are living together as brothers. It is true that uh, we need to do something more to improve the quality of care. Uh, now we are discussing the introduction of, like Thailand did, social health insurance. Uh, what we want to do is not to, 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 to encharge fees to, to the people, but uh, increasing solidarity because we know that there are people who can afford some, some, some health care in the country. So we're still discussing how to do that without uh, worsening the life of, of, our, of our country. Because if someone gets one right, it's difficult to, to, to remove that. So we're trying to, to minimize in terms of uh, giving uh, opportunity to all our people. So it's just that I can, I can, I can add that one, mm. this moment. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, this is quite interesting, the, the process that you are passing through now. Let me move to uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Barolier. Uh, since January 2013, the Gavi Alliance has enforced a new Gavi Alliance Fragility Emergencies Refugee Policy. Can you elaborate a little bit on the countries and context in which this policy uh, provides flexibilities to expand equitable access to immunization? Thank you again, Madam Ambassador. Um, so, uh, effectively, uh, Gavi put in place a, a fragility policy in 2012, which came into force in 2013. But at the time, uh, we were not faced with the dramatic situations that we, we have seen uh, in the last 
four or five years. Uh, so the, that policy was covering a part of the uh, of the issue, but not not fully covering, uh, and not giving necessarily the flexibility uh, to the alliance to deal with uh, urgent issues. Um, and, and as I speak, the board is meeting. Uh, the Gavi board is meeting to, meeting today and tomorrow. Uh, and as a as a public private partnership, the uh, the Gavi alliance has demonstrated its ability to. Um, adapt to uh, to uh, real situation and, and and deal with them, and the first uh, adaptation of the fragility policy came uh, in 2016 when the the board of uh, of Gavi decided to put together a special support for Syria. Um, Syria at the time uh, was not a Gavi supported country, uh, not uh, being above the threshold of. Uh, of a uh, $1,000 uh, GNI. Unfortunately, today, uh, Syria is a, is a Gavi-supported country, but at the time it wasn't, uh, so Gavi could not technically help uh, in Syria, and we were being asked by a number of CSOs, among them uh, MSF and others, to, to support uh, immunization. So the board came together and in December 16 decided to put together a package of uh, $25 million for 17 and the same amount for 18 to support uh, immunization of uh, roughly 3 million uh, children under 5 uh, in Syria. Uh, and that was the first step of uh, taking into account the, the realities on, on the ground. Uh, the board then uh, looked uh, further at uh, at including some uh, some language in our existing policies to make it more flexible and, and in line with the realities of uh, refugee situations. And uh, the policy was further amended in 2017. Uh, and that uh, allowed us to um, help with situations such as the Rohingya um, situation in, uh, in uh, Bangladesh, where uh, the government was able to request uh, funding for immunization of the of the refugees, uh, so 650,000 refugees, um, and uh, of obviously a lot of children, and so the, the the government of Bangladesh had access to stockpiles to immunize uh, children or adults against cholera, uh, because of the living conditions there, you know, making making the risk of outbreaks very high. Uh, and they were also able to tap into other uh, vaccine stockpiles to provide basic immunization for 150,000 children uh, in the refugee camps. Uh, and the same, uh, the same principle uh, applied to uh, another country, uh, the biggest uh, recipient of refugees in Africa, uh, Uganda, uh, where um, we were able to work in the same way to, to to offer uh, immunization to uh, the 1.5 million uh, people who are living, uh, coming from South Sudan. Uh, so that's, uh, in a nutshell, how uh, adjusting the policy has helped us uh, take stock of, uh, of the realities on the ground. Addressing one of, one of the major issues that governments had before, uh, when they were supported by Gavi, they were faced with a choice of uh, immunizing their people or immunizing, immunizing uh, refugees. And, and the change of policy made it possible for them to tap into another, another source of, uh, of support, which, which, is, which is not placing them in front of a choice of uh, dealing with the, the migrants or the refugees or their own populations. Thank you very much. That is a very interesting example, and uh, maybe something to the government will be interested to know if we can apply also for migrants in the future. Uh, let me go to the last uh, uh, speaker, and then I will open the floor for questions from from all of you. So. Uh, could you tell us about the health financing model for improving health insurance coverage and access to essential health care for migrants in Thailand? I know that that's, that is a, a good example that you have. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, as mentioned earlier, that we, as Thailand, already achieved use of health coverage since 2002. And then, uh, that, starting, that is starting point starts from, from the Thai 
native populations. And then we uh, use what we the so-called gradual piecemeal approach in order to, to expand coverage to the non-Thai population. So, so that's why we have to think about who are the non-Thais. And there are several categories of non-Thais, and there, there are several categories of migrants. We, have, we try to cover them, uh, we, tend, we try to expand the coverage bit by bit. And, but in the same time, we, to, we try to ensure that uh, the benefit packages that uh, the beneficiaries in any scheme can enjoy are quite similar. So, so that's, that's the principle. I can give you some examples. Uh, we have the, what, what we call the social security scheme not only for the Thai people, but for regular uh, migrants or migrants who are working in, uh, in the private enterprises, so-called, you can, you can call them the form, formal sector migrants. And so, so formal sector migrants are able to enjoy the benefit package under the social security scheme, similarly to, to the Thai population. So, so this is the payroll contribution scheme. Uh, second is the, you may ask, what about the informal sector migrants? And there are a number of undocumented migrants. Okay, but most of un undocumented migrants are working in, in informal sector. So we, the Ministry of Public Health uh, takes a, uh, took a huge step in 2004, and this is endorsed by by the uh, by the cabinet. So we we re-implemented what we call the migrant health insurance scheme. Somebody may call it health insurance card scheme or whatever. So I may use the term migrant health insurance scheme. This is the prepaid low income. It's like the prepaid premium based, uh, premium based insurance that migrant can pay, let's say for an adult migrant can pay just 50 US dollar a year uh, in order to be covered uh, for any benefit packages uh, under this scheme. And the coverage is one year so they can renew. So this is like, and, and even you are undocumented, my friends, you, you, can, you can buy the insurance card upon the condition that you, you have to register uh, with the government. Uh, when, when, I, when I say register with the government, it means that this is, the, the insurance is part of the, the big process, is, is part of the huge process of, of uh, legalization system so that we can legalize, legalize the und undocumented migrants, make them legalize. So, so this is try to, this is the way that we try to expand not only the health benefit, but also the social, other aspects of social inclusion. Um, we are still, imp we already implemented the stateless, pe the stateless insurance for stateless people as well. So you may think that there are, num there are some Thai populations who uh, fail to register as Thai citizens or Thai nationals due to some reasons in the past. And, and uh, the number of this population is around 500 to 700,000. So in 2010, the cabinet launched what we call the stateless insurance in order to cover the stateless people. Um, these are just some examples. I would like to reiterate that the benefit package of each scheme, of all schemes, are quite similar, and quite similar to the benefit package for the Thai populations. So it covers everything from outpatient care, inpatient care, emergency care, or even high-cost care, like cesarean section, or uh, C-section, chemo, even chemotherapy, or, or the HIV treatment without any co-payment. Uh, without any, I want to reiterate, without any co-payment. So this is the way that we, we try to uh, expand the, the coverage to, to the so-called non-Thai populations. That's a very interesting experience. Uh, congratulations for that. Um, as you see, we have a, a very knowledgeable people here uh, in the panel. And uh, uh, I, I think that uh, in addition to knowledgeable, they have been extremely disciplined. Uh, so we, we have indeed some time to have questions and, and answers from them. And I see that I have already a request for the floor uh, back in, in the room. Ambassador of Sri Lanka, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam. Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, effective uh, and able uh, guidance of deliberations there. And uh, in fact, you know, I, I come to the question, but then I wanted to make a quick uh, remark also. Um, of course, you know, migration is at the forefront of uh, policy discussions in recent years in many countries, including in Sri Lanka. And um, of course, uh, it's a phenomenon that continues to evolve and becomes more complex through increase and uh, 
mix migration flows and uh, of course cul health is a health is an important uh, subject you know because of de social determination health that can impact well-being of the individual as, as a community as a whole and uh, in fact you know uh, migration process can also expose migrants to health uh, risk and many migrants uh, lack uh, access to adequate and equitable health services and financial protection. And uh, also, uh, other concern is uh, the human mobility resulting from migration or international travel can be a critical factor. It is feared very often in the spread of disease and the challenge to controlling it uh, also is an associated uh, issue. But shutting out migrants, uh, you know, purely fearing the spread of uh, diseases may not be appropriate. But uh, saying this one, I just wanted to ask uh, two questions. First, uh, I would like to say uh, thank uh, IOM uh, because you know, IOM helped uh, also Sri Lanka to uh, work on the national health uh, migration health policy that was launched in um, Colombo recently, and also, and also. Uh, the assistance extends in two different areas. One is uh, migration health assessment and travel health assistance and uh, strengthening of border health system. The question is, uh, there are two questions. One is, uh, now when we talk about you know, migra migration uh, and health in the context of migration, and uh, we, we, we hear two different uh, themes or sub-themes rather. In certain places it is described as a kind of a migrant's health in other places, it discussed as a kind of a uh, health, migration health, really. So basically, uh, there are two uh, understandings here. But of course, it is very important to reconcile. But following the GCM, adoption of GCM, I think they are, I feel that they are at a theoretical level, there's a kind of a balance. But what is important is that when you know this migrants' health needs to be put on the top of the agenda as far as migration governance is concerned. The second thing is, you know, the second thing is uh, uh, is about you know uh, unfortunately the issue of uh, migrant health has been uh, misperceived in some quarters as signifying or warranting border control or hardware approaches rather uh, very very uh, uh, you know in order to prevent uh, building upon the comment that I made earlier it is important that uh, health and well-being of migrants in all situations whether it is origin transit or destination. Uh, be given priority, and once in desti destination countries, migrants should uh, be able to uh, benefit from measures aimed at physical and mental health of themselves and their family members. So, just questions is uh, is the balance between migrants' health or the narratives? Uh, are there two different narratives, two different sub themes on migrants' health and uh, migration? Uh, you know, health. Uh, because depending on, you know, our priorities and emphasis may change. Thank you very much, really. Thank you. Let me go through some questions and then come back to the panelists. Uh, Ethiopia, Ambassador, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you, moderator. I, I just will ask to ask a few questions. Uh, I, I would just want to be brief. Uh, I know that uh, in the interest of time, we have to make it short. I. I, I really uh, see the importance of adopting this universal health care in Astana, uh, which is very important. It has been requested by many states. It's actually a uh, long overdue request coming to <coughs> reality. Now, my question is to WHO panelists. Now, how is this global action plan on, on migration and uh, heads is, uh, is envisaged in terms of implementing the UHC strategy uh, because we'd like to know how member states are going to base this global action plan, uh, including, I think, uh, all the private sectors, uh, philanthropic organizations, and um, public private partnership. You know, how are they going to uh, base their uh, whatever uh, program that they have in terms of addressing the health challenge of migrants? And secondly, <clears throat> would be very much interested to know how the WHO is going to work to together with the uh, IOM, which has been investing a lot in uh, <clears throat> the heads of migrants in various initiatives and in the programs. Uh, is there any concrete plan that you are going to work together? Uh, I'm, I'm still talking about in the connection, <clears throat> in the context of the global action plan. And certainly, I think your action plan 
Global Action Plan is talking about refugees and uh, migration, the migrants. But I see a difference between the two categories. Uh, in addition to that, probably when you see some countries have, uh, have the burden of uh, <clears throat> taking responsibility with the large uh, hosting refugee countries and others are with less burden. So how we are going to address this because both of them are totally different. Uh, I just want to know how WHO is thinking about to address this problem with less and major problem facing by refugee hosting countries. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, European Union, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, Deputy Director General, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates. I speak on behalf of the European Union and its member states. International migration is a social determinant impacting the well-being of an individual as well as the receiving communities. Migrants can experience increased health risks, in particular those coming from or finding themselves in a vulnerable or disadvantaged situation. Some of these risks may derive from poorly addressed health conditions in countries of origin. Others may have originated during transit or may be the result of adjustment to a different environment in the receiving society. Victims of trafficking and exploitation and unaccompanied minors are particularly vulnerable. Health and migrant, migration is one of the important areas in which IOM plays a significant role and has always been part of, this has always been part of IOM's core strategy. The EU and its member states acknowledge IOM's work as well as WHO's global and regional efforts. As for the latter, we acknowledge the relevance of the strategy and action plan for refugees and migrant health in the WHO European region adopted in September 2016. The EU and its member states would like to highlight the importance of IOM's continued engagement in the process of the development of the WHO's global action plan to promote the health of refugees and migrants, as well as the involvement of other re relevant organizations, notably UNHCR. The health of migrants has been present in the EU's discourse for many years. The EU has been working to address inequalities in health care, including migrant health issues, since 2003. The EU supports a number of projects which improve access to healthcare for refugees, asylum seekers, regular and irregular migrants. In 2017, the EU provided 1.3 million euros to assess the actual health status of newly arrived migrants and refugees and to support the implementation of tools for integration of migrants and refugees in the EU's health systems. In June 2016, the European Commission adopted an action plan to improve migrant integration. The document states clearly that evidence shows that ill health and lack of access to health services can be a fundamental and ongoing obstacle to integration. In 2017, the EU supported migrant health not only on the front lines, but also in transit and destination countries. The EU is committed to addressing migrant health-related issues in the field of international cooperation. In our partnership with Africa, our focus includes migrant health. In addition, also in 2017, the EU funded a project by IOM on access to health centers along the Turkish-Syrian border. Moreover, as part of the asylum package proposal, the European Commission put forward provisions reflecting the EU's dedication to ensure access to health care, including both physical and mental health care, to asylum seekers and beneficiaries of international protections as applicable. Coordinated efforts are needed to ensure that migrant health needs, including mental health, are adequately incorporated in healthcare policies and plans in countries of origin, transit and destination. The EU acknowledges the work by IOM on this matter. IOM has long-standing experience delivering comprehensive migration health programs grounded in a human rights-based approach. With support by the EU, IOM has been working to improve healthcare services for migrants within EU member states. IOM also supported the EU in prepar preparing a personal health record, a single unified instrument for the assessment of the health status of refugees and migrants. This helps healthcare professionals in the receiving countries to build medical histories of incoming migrants and refugees and identify their immediate needs. I thank you very much. Thanks to the EU for their comments. Um, Ecuador, you have the floor.
Sorry. Señora Presidenta, muchas gracias. Una vez más, nuestro reconocimiento a los panelistas por la exposición sobre migración y salud. Saludamos la incorporación de la temática de la salud en el contexto de la migración en los debates de este Consejo. En momentos en los que los flujos migratorios han alcanzado niveles históricos y en particular a puertas de la adopción de los pactos mundiales para migrantes y refugiados. Ecuador está desplegando y ha desplegado grandes esfuerzos en la prestación de servicios de salud para personas en situación de movilidad humana, en virtud del mandato constitucional que establece la obligación del Estado de garantizar el derecho a la salud y el acceso al Sistema Nacional de Salud Pública a todas las personas en su territorio sin discriminación por su condición migratoria. La salud es un derecho humano fundamental y un componente esencial del desarrollo sostenible. Estar y mantenerse saludable es una condición previa fundamental para que los migrantes puedan contribuir al desarrollo social y económico de sus comunidades de origen y destino, por lo que su inclusión en las respuestas de los sistemas de salud es fundamental. En este sentido, observamos con satisfacción la colaboración entre la OIM y la Organización Mundial de la Salud para abordar los problemas de migración y salud, especialmente ahora que se discute la elaboración de un plan de acción sobre salud de refugiados y migrantes. Consideramos que este plan tiene el potencial de ser una hoja de ruta para los compromisos relacionados con salud en los dos pactos mundiales para refugiados y migrantes. El Plan de Acción sobre Salud de Refugiados y Migrantes no debería crear nuevas responsabilidades en los países de acogida. Somos conscientes de las distintas realidades nacionales y capacidades para atender las necesidades de salud de las personas en movilidad humana. Sin embargo, estas realidades no impiden encontrar soluciones y aprender de las buenas prácticas existentes para crear coherentes políticas de salud sensibles a los migrantes. Consideramos que los objetivos del plan merecen la atención de la comunidad internacional en su conjunto, a efectos de asegurar un reparto justo y eficaz de las cargas y responsabilidades, en particular en lo relativo a la disminución de presiones en los países de acogida y para garantizar que otros países y actores compartan la responsabilidad de manera más equitativa para abordar las necesidades de salud de migrantes y refugiados. Esperamos que la OIM continúe ayudando a los estados a abordar los problemas de migración y salud a través del desarrollo de capacidades, asistencia técnica y difusión de información a fin de formular e implementar políticas armonizadas para garantizar la accesibilidad a los servicios de salud para los migrantes. Adicionalmente, alentamos a la OIM a que en su nuevo rol como Secretaría de la Red de Migración de Naciones Unidas, refuerce su coordinación con las agencias y programas del Sistema de Naciones Unidas, como la OMS, la Organización Mundial de la Salud, el Programa Conjunto de las Naciones Unidas sobre el VIH, SIDA, ONU-SIDA, y la Oficina del Alto Comisionado de las Naciones Unidas para los Refugiados, para aprovechar la experticia de cada uno de estos organismos 
y generar sinergias que permitan aprovechar de mejor manera los recursos humanos, técnicos, financieros y de esta manera evitar la duplicación de funciones y esfuerzos, todo con la finalidad de mejorar la asistencia y protección en salud de los migrantes en general. Gracias. Gracias, Ecuador. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, next speakers. I have still six uh, speakers uh, in my list, seven now. So I am going to ask uh, you to be as disciplined as the panel members were, and please uh, ask very sharp questions so that we can provide them, uh, panelists, again, a time to respond. Uh, so let me move to Venezuela. Tienen la palabra. Muchas gracias, directora general, y sí, trataré de ser breve. Mi delegación agradece a los panelistas por sus contribuciones con respecto a la relación entre la migración y la salud. Venezuela reconoce el importante vínculo entre el desarrollo económico de un país y la salud integral de sus ciudadanos y habitantes, incluyendo a los migrantes y refugiados. Considera que la inclusión de los migrantes en el sistema de salud pública no solo es una buena práctica, sino que constituye una política fundamental para el desarrollo integral. Las barreras administrativas y las normas restrictivas en contra de los migrantes, lamentablemente, contribuyen inadvertidamente a la proliferación de actitudes racistas y xenófobas. Es motivo de orgullo para Venezuela que los más de 8 millones de migrantes recibidos por el Estado venezolano durante varias décadas, provenientes de países hermanos, disfrutan del acceso a todos los servicios de salud, alimentación y educación pública de las mismas condiciones que los nacionales. Además, nuestro país apoya los esfuerzos de la Organización Mundial de la Salud en cuanto a la preparación de un plan de acción mundial en materia de salud para los migrantes y refugiados, con el fin de permitir a los Estados la protección de la salud de migrantes y refugiados de forma progresiva y en la medida de sus posibilidades. Este plan ofrece grandes oportunidades. No obstante, debemos reconocer que estas estrategias enfrentan importantes desafíos presupuestarios y financieros. En términos operativos, la mayoría de las contribuciones para la cooperación continúan siendo condicionadas o preasignadas, disminuyendo la capacidad de, la, de respuesta de organizaciones como la OIM o la OMS, en sectores tan importantes y urgentes como la salud y la alimentación. Asimismo, deploramos que muchos países de recepción, entre los cuales se encuentra Venezuela, estén siendo objeto de políticas de hostigamiento económico, como son las medidas coercitivas unilaterales que obstaculizan las posibilidades de permanencia en el país de refugiados inmigrantes. Adicionalmente, las iniciativas resultantes a las deliberaciones previstas en el 2019 tienen el enorme reto de guardar coherencia con los objetivos de la Declaración de Nueva York sobre refugiados inmigrantes de 2016. En consecuencia, con el Pacto Mundial sobre Refugiados y el Pacto Mundial para la Migración, segura, ordenada y regular, para asegurar que no exista solapamiento o duplicación de iniciativas, así como también para asegurar la existencia de los recursos requeridos. En este sentido, nos planteamos la siguiente pregunta. ¿Cuáles serían las medidas que debería tomar la OIM y la OMS para contribuir con los Estados frente a estos importantes retos? Muchas gracias. Gracias, Venezuela. Eh, Italy, Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, moderator, excellencies, distinguished delegates. I would like to express our deep appreciation for the choice of the topic of this panel discussion and thank the panelists for their interesting presentation. As it was already pointed out by the EU and others, migrants can experience increased health risk, in particular those coming from or finding themselves in vulnerable or disadvantageous situations during their journey. Health and migration are one of the important areas in which IUM can play a significant role. In this regard, I would just like to highlight Italy's commitment to work closely with all the organizations and actors involved to ensure access to health care for migrants in countries of origin and in countries of transit, especially in African countries. Very recently, thanks to the Africa Fund of the Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, 
Two projects worth 1 million euro each were funded in cooperation with WHO and IOM. The first is designed to meet the urgent need of surveillance, di diagnostic and treatment services for migrants held in detention centers in Libya. The project doesn't only protect the health and welfare of migrants in detention facilities in the country of transit, but it also contributes to the prevention efforts along the migration routes and in countries of origin to which migrants may return. The second aims at, at improving the access to medical assistance of migrants and of particularly vulnerable Egyptian hosting communities by building the IOM operation capacity in the country. You, um, you asked uh, uh, what kind of, uh, uh, of question we can put forward. Well, we look forward to continue this fruitful cooperation with the IOM, and we would like to flag how much more remains to be done in this field. However, a lot of uh, uh, elements are still to be decided. In this sense, we ask if it cannot be useful to produce a list of the criticalities and the, possi and the possibilities of response to give to these uh, criticalities. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, Sudan, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Moderators, and I uh, would like also to thank the panelists for their fruitful and constructive input they gave. Uh, actually, the panelists from the WHO has talked about the universal health coverage, and uh, she uh, and we all know that this universal health coverage has faced many challenges, and the immigration context, uh, the challenge is double. And she has mentioned that three challenges face this uh, universal health coverage. And she mentioned them as uh, diluted voices, the economy of the migrant health, and lack of data. The question is that, uh, what is the financial resources that the WHO allocated for this kind of interventions? Uh, the second question, uh, as she mentioned that the amount of data is very scarce and uh, uh, is low, we want to know what amount of data that uh, is found and what uh, uh, we, we put in mind that these countries in there is many uh, migrations has faced internal challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Sudan. Netherlands. Thank you, Madam Chair. We align ourselves with a statement by the EU and would like to add a few remarks in our national capacity. We are glad to hear that the contribution of Mozambique and Thailand showed that migrants can continue receiving treatment in their countries of destination. This continuation is very important for chronic diseases like diabetes and communicable diseases like HIV and TB. In certain circumstances, migrants can also be at an increased risk of mental health problems. Despite high needs, Mental health and psychosocial support are not yet well integrated into the support to migrants. Services are often fragmented or standalone activities. A multi sectoral approach, which includes health, protection, and education, aimed at individual and collective recovery, is critical to restoring day to day functioning on all levels. IOM is in an excellent position to promote the integration of mental health and psychosocial support across different sectors. Hence also our question, does IOM have a multi-sectoral strategy for migrant health? Thank you. Thank you very much, Netherlands. France, Isabella Barra. Merci, Madame la Directrice Générale Adjointe. La France associe à la déclaration prononcée par l'Union Européenne. Nous aurons seulement quelques remarques complémentaires. Permettez-moi en premier lieu de remercier les panélistes pour leurs interventions qui témoignent de l'importance des politiques cohérentes pour garantir la santé dans le contexte migratoire. À cet égard, la France est convaincue qu'il est indispensable d'atteindre la couverture de santé universelle car elle constitue un objectif de santé universelle et globale. La bonne santé des migrants est en effet une condition préalable et un impératif pour répondre aux besoins de santé de la société dans son ensemble. Il convient donc d'améliorer leur accès à la santé, en particulier celle des femmes, des enfants et des adolescents. Cela suppose de prendre des mesures nécessaires pour garantir l'accès 
à un ensemble minimum de services essentiels en matière de droits et de santé sexuelle et reproductif, de soins de santé maternelle et infantile, sans imposer aux usagers des dépenses de santé inaccessibles. Par ailleurs, nous devons protéger et améliorer la santé mentale des migrants et fournir des soins aux victimes de traumatismes et de violences. Enfin, nous devons renforcer la capacité des États à prendre en compte les déterminants sociaux de la santé, y compris l'amélioration de l'eau, l'assainissement, du logement et de l'éducation, dans toutes les politiques pour promouvoir l'égalité de santé des migrants et des citoyens. Madame la directrice générale adjointe, atteindre la couverture de santé universelle relève de la responsabilité de chaque pays, y compris les gouvernements, la société civile et le secteur privé, comme il relève de la responsabilité de chaque pays de promouvoir le droit des migrants, de jouir du meilleur état de santé physique et mentale possible. Nous réussirons ainsi à créer des sociétés plus équitables et plus inclusives, conformément à l'objectif de l'agenda 2030, ne laisser personne de côté. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. South Africa, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and the panelists for the inputs. Uh, I would first like to commend the panelists from Mozambique on the advocacy to companies to better protect uh, their, um, the, the health of their workers. Secondly, I would also like to go on and commend the panel from Mozambique again on, on the sexual education and behavior to workers, particularly with uh, HIV AIDS, which is prevalent, particularly in, with migrant workers in, in the mining sector in South Africa. We also welcome the early diagnosis and treatment, particularly again of, a, of, of, of HIV AIDS and TB, which are prevalent in, in the region and particularly to migrant workers in the mining sectors in South Africa. And lastly, just a question to the panelists from Gavi. In, in Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africa, are there any other countries that you provide uh, vaccinations to? Thank you very much. Thank you, and finally, I will give the floor to ICMC. Thanks very much for your patience. Good afternoon, Madam Deputy Director. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and thank you very much uh, to all of our panelists. The International Catholic Migration Commission expresses its urgent concern regarding the many obstacles faced by people on the move to accessing available, affordable, and quality health care services. With our field experience in mind, we'd like to highlight a few observations that the WHO made at its 140th session. Worldwide access to health services among vulnerable migrants and refugees within recipient countries remains highly variable and is not consistently addressed. The health needs of migrants and refugees may differ significantly from those of the populations of recipient countries. Delayed or deferred care and a lack of appropriate preventative services are associated with the progression of diseases and the subsequent need for more extensive and costly treatment. Hunger, famine, and lack of access to potable water are both causes and effects of mass movements of people and obviously take a major toll on the health status of those affected. ICMC urges member states to prioritize healthcare access for people on the move. And we know from assisting displaced women, men, and children that their ability to stay healthy and adequately provide for their families can be compromised because many are marginalized and may face considerable barriers in accessing equitable social and healthcare services. Thus, in order to achieve SDG Target 3.8, which calls for universal health coverage, migrants, regardless of their status, will need safe, effective, and affordable essential medicines and vaccines, access to high-quality health care, nutritious foods and clean water, and cross-border continuity of health care. Ms. Yamamoto, you, I heard you put uh, health and uh, solidarity with migrants together. And you know what? Uh, Pope Francis did too. And so I'd like to uh, conclude with his words that were in observance of the, uh, the World Day of Migrants and Refugees in January of this year. 
The situation of migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees requires that they be guaranteed personal safety and access to basic services. Migratory status should not limit access to national health care. Solidarity must be concretely expressed at every stage of the migratory experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before uh, giving the floor to the panelists to answer the questions, uh, we have a very limited uh, time frame, but I would like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Jacqueline Wickers, that is our Director of Migration Health Division, uh, and ask her uh, to answer some of the questions that you asked uh, about IOM's engagement in health. Please, go ahead, Jacqueline. Okay, thank you very much uh, for, for the many comments and um, um, also for the support that many of you have uh, uh, provided us with uh, over the years uh, to enable us to, to deliver our, our services. Um, um, uh, share, um, dear DDG, I want to speak French to you. <laughs> can I first answer some concrete questions before I can make my statement? Yeah? Okay, good. Uh, I want to... Um, Highlight um, and that maybe groups several of the of the questions that, that were made. Um, that uh, it was actually you, the member states, who asked uh, WHO not so long ago in an executive board to to work on uh, this particular topic. And uh, I must say, uh, probably also thanks to your your decision in the executive board of WHO, I will not dwell too much on it. Uh, we have indeed been working hand in hand, HER, IOM, and WHO, um, on ensuring that uh, the topic of health is mainstreamed in both the compacts. And uh, the global action plan is, is, I think, really a way forward for us. And it is not a surprise that actually our MOU also is being revised now, a long-standing MOU is, is being revised now with WHO. So we're very well aware of what is ahead and how we can best respond to you. On the Netherlands intervention on, on mental health, I want to underline that uh, mental health and psychosocial support has been a core part of our services and core part of our team uh, for many years. And we address mental health and psychosocial issues before departure, doing travel, uh, upon arrival, and also return home. It's, it's for us an integrated part of, of our response. Um, thank you. I can also like to take some time to make a statement, um, which may also be a response to some of your questions. Um, uh, this panel, which is discussing the topic of migration health in the IOM governing bodies, is in itself a reflection of my principal message that migration health is a multi-sectoral undertaking, which makes the topic so interesting but also so vulnerable to being left behind and left out of global health and global migration debates. And this is why today we are putting it in the limelight at the Council of IRM to illustrate our efforts to mainstream health in migration policy discussions. Another key message we heard about today is that there is no public health without migrant health. Considering growing diversity in societies because of aging populations, gaps in labor markets and crises of various nature, global health security, public health goals and disease elimination can only be achieved by addressing the health of all and in particular the hardest to reach or marginalized um, who are the most vulnerable to ill health and to being excluded from national health programs. Finally, addressing the health of migrants and families is not only the right thing to do from a human rights and public health perspective, but also from a development and economic perspective. Healthy migrants contribute to development in home and host countries, most work and pay taxes. Those who attended the lunch event earlier today uh, heard the important economic arguments for migrant inclusive health systems. Access for migrants to health services, especially primary health care, and ensuring social protection and health, like Thailand and Mozambique just illustrated, are smart ways to ensure migrants can fully contribute to societies on the one hand, and to respond to health security concerns on the other hand. As the IRM Migration Health Division, we are proud to have the privilege to work with migrants <clears throat> world over and be able to offer them with needed health services. 
For instance, in 2017, close to 400,000 beneficiaries were vaccinated, and 2.4 primary healthcare consultations provided in fragile contexts. More than 350,000 pre-departure health assessments for refugees and migrants were carried out, coming from more than 80 countries. And close to 300,000 beneficiaries were reached with mental health and psychosocial support in crisis settings. We are proud of the trust not only member states but also migrants put in us to assist them when embarking on their new lives or in transit, stranded or returning home. This is what drives us and this is why we have experiences and data and this is why we want to make sure that what we learn is shared and feeds our partnerships with UN agencies, member states and beyond. It's worth mentioning that IOM joined the UHC, Universal Health Coverage 2030 partnership last year and we welcome that also civil society organizations take part in this partnership. I thank the DDG, um, the panelists, the audience for your valuable contributions and hope we will continue to jointly move our agendas to yet another level and walk together on the road to universal health coverage, which of course cannot leave migrants behind. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacqueline. Let me then move to uh, responses. And I think the majority of the questions were asked to WHO. So I will start with you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much is a uh, very, again, very serious comment and also uh, questions. Uh, let me say, start. Uh, WHO, uh, some of them know about it. WHO uh, created, after the Tedros took the position of DG Director General, we created a new, uh, our plan, five years plan, and, uh, and the UH Universal Health Coverage is one of the biggest priority of our organization. And you may know that WHO originally, we are normative functions organization. Uh, rather than implementing, implementing organization, but now WHO also going to work together with other UN agencies, including IOM, to work at the country level much more than ever. And um, having said that, uh, thank you very much, Sri Lanka Ambassador uh, mentioned about the migrants' health and the health for, about the migrant issues. Thank you very much. I, I really uh, appreciate your point. And uh, Ethiopia, Ambassador Ethiopia asked the question about uh, uh, migrants and refugees and uh, the different approach and uh, the uh, issues. Yes, uh, when you go to the country level and regional level, each country has their own different uh, issues and different uh, challenges. So countries' uh, the support is uh, definitely we need to be, we should say, uh, based on the country ownership and terrorized approach. But uh, at the same time, the regional uh, dialogue and global dialogue also, uh, we think it's very important. And uh, thank you very much, EU. EU also supports the UHC and the health issues very broadly. So I'm uh, really happy to continue to, uh, would like to continue the dialogue. And uh, there are a couple of questions, but uh, maybe I pick up several issues. For example, oh, first of all, Sudan uh, the, uh, asked about uh, our uh, financing uh, or some our uh, support to the countries. Again, WHO is not a funding agency. We, we are not a humanitarian agency. But uh, as a technical agency, together with other UN agencies, uh, we would uh, like to support the country to create a good health system uh, in, uh, uh, for UHC to uh, inclusive health system, inclusive health system, I should say, including migrant. Because um, if you see the global economy, and, and some countries talk about uh, develop, um, development and migrants, if you see the global economy, income between the countries, inequality of the income of, uh, between the countries is decreasing. Means many countries are now in the develop, economic growth is coming, and we would like to use this opportunity to make a good health system in the, each countries in a more inclusive way and a sustainable way. Uh, and thank you very much to the Netherlands to talk about mental health. And uh, finally, uh, ICMG mentioned clearly about their uh, statement. And uh, definitely, uh, we, WHO and IOM, 
uh, we exchange MOU and uh, try to enhance our uh, collaboration. Um, but uh, at this moment, we, we need to identify the concrete action. We need to need more dialogue. But uh, during the process of the action uh, plan uh, development of uh, migrants and health, uh, we could identify uh, the future, I hope. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, my comment is not enough to cover all relevant, all uh, important comments and uh, questions. But uh, uh, I, uh, as the WHO, we recognize WHO also need to do more for migrants and health. Uh, I thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mujovo, you have a question too? Thank you. Uh, the majority for me, I think it was comments. Uh, I, think, I, I thank comments done to Mozambique. But one thing I, I want to emphasize is in this, in this binomial, OMS or OIT, it's important to add Local, local governments, because I believe that the, at the local level, there is still more fragmentation, and it's possible to maximize uh, resources from the country level. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mujawo, very much. Uh, Mr. Varolia. Thank you. So to answer the question, I think it was from South Africa. Um, the, the, we, Gavi supports almost uh, all of the sub-Saharan uh, African countries, particularly uh, Sudan, Somalia, uh, but also Chad. Uh, and just to take the example of Sudan, uh, there are eight vaccines that are supported uh, in, uh, in Sudan. Uh, in Somalia, uh, two vaccines, but also uh, uh, health system strengthening uh, funding, uh, as well as cold chain uh, equipment funding. Thank you very much. And the final comment for Mr. Supanchai Mai. Thank you. Uh, um, I would like to encapsulate uh, my points here that no policy is perfect, and we are always facing we are always facing the implementation challenges. Even though we have a number of resolution, high level resolutions, including the, the GCM, and or even your, you have the policies on the paper in your countries, but no policies are perfect. And you, when when we face the implementation challenges, we need um, concerted efforts from from all parties, and we need multi-sectoral approach to, to deal with migrants, because migrant is a complex issue. Um, for, for, example, for example, in Thailand, we have the health insurance policy, but it doesn't mean that we can ensure that 100% of migrants will be insured, because some migrants may, may, may be ignorant of the existence of the policy as well, some, something about that. So that, that's why we have to uh, implement some parallel supporting policies, like the community health workers. And, there are also some concerted efforts from other ministries, like from the Ministry of Interior, Minister of Labor, uh, including the Ministry of Education. Um, when I say that we face some, we always face some implementation implementation challenges, uh, because my gun is a never-ending story. But it doesn't mean that we, we can cannot do anything. We can do something about that, and this is the long way to go to to achieve your self health coverage. And this is not a matter of a single country. We need concerted effort, not only within the country, but between countries as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any final comment from any one of you? <laughs> so I wanted to thank again uh, IOM for uh, inviting Gavi. Uh, it is a relatively new space uh, for us, and, uh, and I think we we learn as we go, and we are all uh, learning organizations. So uh, I think it's not the end of the story. It's pretty much the beginning. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah? <laughs> no, no. Okay. okay. I just say that uh, 
Thank you very much again. I go to the Gabby and friends, uh, Pascal. Thank you very much for inviting me. And definitely, we have many things we can do at the country level and local level. Thank you. Gentlemen? No? Just to say from, from our side, first of all, um, I think uh, we heard the message loud and clear. We have been working with WHO uh, for, for a long period of time. It's, yeah. it's, it's not an, a new relationship on migrant yeah. health. Uh, and uh, actually, a lot of the um, decisions and resolutions that have been decided in WHO have been also working in close collaboration with, with uh, uh, IOM in the past. But certainly, I think the, the Global Compact on Migration offers uh, us, as organizations, uh, a broader opportunity to try to bring together uh, even more our, our efforts to try uh, to protect the migrant health of, of migrants much better and to incorporate that into our own policies. Uh, because obviously, the, the people that follow WHO is not the people that come to our own council. Mm, yeah. uh, and there is uh, a cross-cutting uh, issue there that is important for us to address together. Uh, so, and certainly uh, agencies like Gavi uh, in the future will be uh, very uh, important for us. And I think, it's, as you said, it's, it's part of a beginning of a, of a new way of dealing and, and relation uh, together. Besides that, thank you very much to the uh, two representatives of the government, uh, and thanks to all of you that have recognized the work that, uh, that you do and that we do uh, together uh, at the country level. I think IOM has a long story of uh, support on uh, the health of migrants and migrant health, uh, and uh, is, is something that uh, uh, we are planning certainly to continue and try to work closer with other entities in this new role of the organization. So thank you again for being here and for participating. And thanks to all of you for being very active uh, and engaged into, into this discussion. Uh, now I have to change my hat and invite the chair uh, to come to continue uh, the uh, general debate. And I, I ask a round of applauses from everybody to the panelists. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.